In the early 1900s, both our fathers worked on the same mine in Johannesburg. My father came to Cran Mines from the rural Transkei when he was 17 years old. My father left a Jewish government school to work on the mines. He was 13 years old. Although we were both born in the same town, we may as well have been born in different countries. I remember in June 16, 1976, when our innocent brothers and sisters were dying like ants. Their blood were flowing the street like Limpompo River. Oh, I can't see my enemy today because my eyes are full of tears because of tear gas. I heard the voice said, Taba, Taba, Kiao Maponisa, but I can't see the policeman because my eyes are full of tears because of tear gas. When I ask Bota, Bota, what are you trying by doing this? Killing our brothers, sisters, parents. But I replies, I want to keep order in Soweto. But I want to keep order in Soweto by killing innocent people. Wow. 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 Oh, Mama and dear Lila, Mama, I'm crying. Mama. <laughs> Zapalala, zapalala, zakriteka inyembe zize tu mama. Vukani madoda, nisilwele umuzika bawo mawa. Vukani bafazi, nisilwele umuzika bawo mama. I palala nyembe. We set out to make a journey into our pasts, to tell of our different lives and our skin colour in this country of our birth. We started here in the Karoo to revisit the landscapes of our childhood. You know, Betty, driving through the Karoo today reminds me of my first trip when I traveled to the boarding school by train. I just couldn't find anything beautiful about it. I saw a vast expanse of arid country, which looked so formidable. And my immediate reaction was, gosh, such big spaces of land. And where I come from, people are so crowded in those ghettos. I love the emptiness, the loneliness, and the vastness. And every year when we came on holiday, one of the most exciting things was traveling through the Karoo. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember trying to, you know, look out the window to try and get this, you know, landscape. I'd always find the grit of the engine getting into my eyes. And suddenly I realized that all the black coaches were immediately behind the engine mm. and all the white ones were further away and of course they were not going to get the smoke from the engine and the grit and all that. <laughs> Suddenly you'd get into a station and see many boys begging in the train, oh, yes, I begging remember. from the trains. And these boys, in order to survive, had to trick the police and only start running when the train, the train started stopped. moving so that they couldn't be arrested. They would run, you know, rhythmically and call out, Posa Mama, 
Posa sisi, posa missis. And then people would start throwing food, throwing money. And you know, I could never forget that desolation and hunger in their faces and going through the indignity of, of picking up the food that was thrown at them. And I just said to myself, I would never love the Karu because well, of that. I'm ashamed to say that our greatest treat on going on holiday was my father would give each a bag of pennies. And that was our greatest treat was throwing the pennies out, the little pickanins, as they were called. And we did it with joy, but I didn't connect. These kids were starving. It was like a little game for us. For generations, my people have emerged from their slums to serve their white masters. Sometimes they have graciously been given small leftovers to take back to their impoverished families. As I see the Union Jack being lowered over the smart colonial hotel and hear the sound of the last post, I know that last post will soon echo around this land, signalling the end of our domination over a once patient people. On those rare occasions when we went to the sea on holiday, I remember always feeling humiliated when I read the hateful signs reserved for whites only. We would sometimes dare to step from our stony beach onto their nice sandy one, but always with the fear of being arrested by the police who constantly patrolled to keep us in our place. We lay on those beaches, basking in the sun, rubbing ourselves with suntan lotion, changing positions ever so often to get an even tan and make our white skins as dark as possible. Those with dark skins from birth, we put out of sight. We threw them out onto the arid sand dunes of Mitchell's Plain, where nothing would grow or thrive, where we did not have to see them. We bulldozed their beloved homes in District 6. It was too close to our beautiful Table Mountain. We cut them out like a cancerous growth. But because we are a Christian country, we left their churches standing. Standing as a constant reminder of the mutilation we have inflicted on a people. In desperation, those coming from other parts of the country in search of work built tin shacks in which to survive next to our shiny cities. We evicted them again and again and again, but we did allow them to travel long distances in to serve our needs. They kept our swimming pools clear and bright blue and then returned to where we sent them.
My father devoted 60 years of his life to crown mines. He worked as Induna in charge of the black labor force and was highly respected by his fellow workers. A close friend of my father's was Mr. Dietzi, who was chief clerk at Crown Mines. That man had power. Everyone, if a manager had to be employed as a manager, his boss, Chindan, we used to call him Chindan, uh, he used to call, he says, honey boy, do you think this man will do this? White or, manager. A white, white manager. He says, you see, do you think this man will do for the job as a manager? Say at 17 or 16. Then it, if, it, if he didn't want, he'd do this. And that's the end of it. <laughs> really? That's, that's just the end of it. And, and Mr. Lawrence will know. That he doesn't want he it. He doesn't want it. And my uncle used to tell me when you were kids that my father always used to call those big managers and any other white man, Gwedin. That's right. When yeah. he was angry. That's right. And Gwedin, you know, in yeah. our language means you're just a yes, youngster. Just a pikanin. <laughs> pikanin. That's right. He called everyone Gwedin. <laughs> My mother was the first woman principal of the Crown Mine School. She taught us her favorite poem. Di mnyama ndifana no tata, di azila ngobu mnyama bam. I am black like my father. I am proud of being black. You remember, Mr. Ditsi, how the whites in those days used to call every man, irrespective of his age, a boy in the mines? Yeah, that, 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 that thing was common. It was the only thing for them to, to do. Everyone was just boy. He can be an old man, he can be a youngster, just boy. Walking down Ilo Street, you know, you had to clear, if you're a black man, you just had to clear, because there's a white man coming. He, he just walks, he doesn't see you, you don't exist. He, he just he sort of walks right through you, if you don't give way. He doesn't even see your shadow. No, no, he doesn't. Mm. You don't, you're not there. You're not there. And, but we are so used to it. There used to be grace of the first people that got killed. Today they've, they've uh, moved those mine dumps and trees are dug up. And what about the bones of those people that died for this gold of theirs? My father joined the Stock Exchange in 1919. No matter how wealthy he became, he was always afraid. He lived in terror of ever being poor again. His parents left Russia because of the persecution of Jews. In Russia, they had been restricted as to where they could live and as to the work they could do. They lived in the ghettos in constant fear of pogroms. Look, all these people with telephones. Mm. And up there. What's all those charts about? There's the prices. Uh -huh. And they keep changing. And look if you look here. As they get up. They arrived in South Africa at the end of the Boer War, penniless and having suffered great hardships. But as white emigrants, they were welcomed to a country rich in opportunities and were immediately accepted as citizens. Up. 
They were determined to succeed in this new land at all costs. And like all that generation of white immigrants, they were totally oblivious to the plight of the black population. I grew up to the sound of the stock exchange reports. My father would listen to the wireless every morning and every night. In those days, gold shares were called kaffirs, as indeed were the black men working in the mines. If there was brisk trading in gold shares, they would say that kaffirs were lively. In this house in which I was born, we had six servants to cater to the needs of our small family, whose whiteness gave us our passport to privilege. Our servants had one thing in common. They were forbidden by law to have their families stay with them. They all lived in our tiny, concreted backyard. Maggie McGarber was our cook. She started working for my mother in 1926. Little man, you're crying, I know why you're blue, someone took your kitty cat. When I was seven years old, my mother died. There was only one person I could turn to, and that was Maggie. I would sit in the kitchen and share her mealy pop. I felt safe in that kitchen. Every night, she would put me to bed with one song. Tell you what we'll do. Dad will get you new ones right away. Better go to sleep now, little man. You've had a busy day. You've been playing soldiers. The battle has Maggie spent her last dying years with her daughter Tandiwe in this house in Soweto. But I wondered what was happening to you in all those long years that your mother worked for us and loved us. What was happening to you and your brother? Well, before that, uh, we were in a small town, Redrick, and uh, staying with my grandmother, Nomalanga, I'll call her Nomalanga, instead of the other name. We stayed with her, it was for, for some time, and I think at around about 1930, or early, I don't know, I, I, heard, I had a mother, and her name was Maggie. Maggie, well, used to work, I think, at your place, and uh, she used to pass Craddock on her way to Musenberg with your family and uh, I think the kids and uh, she'd spend a few days with us there. In fact, uh, before those years, I did not know I had a mother in Johannesburg. But all the same, I remember my granny used to tell us and show us clothes. Even the clothes that we were wearing in these pictures were sent by Maggie from Johannesburg. And she used to send her mother some clothes too and money for us to be fed and uh, looked after. And when you came to visit your mother at our house, yes. were you allowed to stay the night with your mother or did you have to sneak in? Well, we used to sneak in, but uh, we slept there. Yes, we slept there in her, in her little room. Yes, I used to sleep with her and my brother used to sleep on the floor. Little man, you're crying. We just accepted uh, that she was trying to do the best for us, to keep us going. In fact, uh, during that time, we just felt parents had to work to keep uh, their home fires burning. Anyway, it was literally 40 years before you were ever able to live with your mother. That's right. Black children were unknown to me as I lived in an all-white suburb and went to an all-white school where I was taught by a dedicated band of nuns all about love, compassion, and charity.
but it was a love, compassion and charity in an all-white world. You know, Betty, it was here in Killington I wrote my metric. Our teachers were both black and white and they shared a common staff room, which was unusual for that time. But still the school was all black, wasn't yes, it? Yes, but the school was all mm. black, and it's amazing how I never questioned the fact that there were no white kids mm. in the school. Same and as me. we took it for- We all took our segregation mm. as part of normal life, didn't we? Looking at the South African flag now, I don't feel patriotic about it. I hate it, in fact, because I feel I'm not part of this country because I've been excluded and my citizenship has been stripped. And I don't see how I could be sentimental about a flag that, was our, that I was not party to. I remember how we used to go to town at the end of the month in Pretoria to do our shopping. And I would be damn scared of walking on the pavement because at that time, the black people were not allowed to walk on the pavement. They had to be on the street. And I resented that but I never questioned or even resisted. When I left Kilnerton, I went to Forte University in Alice. And that's where my life changed. I joined the Youth League of the ANC. And I'm so happy about that because nobody ever even pleaded with me to join. We used to worship Mr. Mandela and Oliver Tambo, and how an angry people were still determined to undergo a passive resistance. If only they had felt the impact of the defiance campaign and the protests that the ANC and many other people made those years, we wouldn't be in the state of affairs that we find ourselves in now. I really agonize for my country. And I think we have reached a point in our lives where we are going to accept violence as the only answer. Nelson Mandela asked for democracy for his people and was given life imprisonment in return. His courage and resistance is an inspiration to us. Our children, even the small ones, revere him and call him Ubaba Wetu, our father, our leader. Really Fiki Lebam served 10 years on Robben Island for his political beliefs. It was there he met and worked with Mandela. I went to jail at a very young age, at 23, mm -hmm. and I can safely say that all I know about law and about life and about politics, it was um, what he taught me, because we spent a lot of time together, okay. working together. Um, and it, it was really a wonderful experience. It's something which people don't believe this, but I don't regret my experience mm -hmm. uh, for having gone to prison that time. Finally, when you had to sail from the island and you look out and you see the island, and as you're receding away from it, it's a real pain. And you imagine that all your friends are there and some of them will be there for a long time and others for a lifetime, like Mandela. He had said that when we come out, we have got to indicate to people that uh, we knew it was worthwhile to have been on the island. We should always be an example to people. We should be strong and our morale should be high. We should go on and do our jobs even more competently than if we had not been to prison. 
Joyce and Tiny Mashonini were that generation who fought for a peaceful change and were imprisoned without charge or trial. Tiny, a respected trade unionist, suffered six months in solitary confinement. Joha, I'd like to share with you one nasty experience which I experienced during my detention. There was a day when I was just thinking about my whole family. And Joha, I could not recollect who my baby's name is. You mean Dudu? Yes. Joha, that very simple name, Dudu. Joha, it means I tortured myself for the whole time, Joha, trying to recollect, you know. She has more than one name, but I couldn't remember. Not even one of her names, Joha. I don't think that there's anything as saddening as that to forget your own child's name. Especially Dudu, because the two of you are so close together. She's my baby. So these are the, some of the things which we experience with the solitary confinement. You know, Tiny, when you shared your, the effect that your detention had on you, you know, to the extent that you could actually forget your child's name, we I suddenly remembered, you know, the effect my detention had on my little girl, Michelle, when she was only five years then. I remember after my release, we, she and I were driving from town, you know, going home, and we were stopped uh, at a roadblock near Canada. And, you know, it was just an ordinary roadblock, you know, checking, you know, brakes, lights, and so on. But I can never forget the way that child was terrified in the car. She screamed, Mommy, Mommy, run away. They mustn't get you again. I held her on the seat. No, Mish, it's just the traffic people checking our brakes. There's nothing. And she screamed and screamed. And the traffic policeman was so surprised. And he came to the window and said, what's wrong with your child? And I just said, leave us alone. As a mother, I feel a sorry for the family of Andrew Zonder in the tragedy which has befallen them. Their son has been executed for planting a limpet mine which killed five white people. I respect the father of Konyo Smith for having the courage to implore the government to negotiate with the ANC so that his son's death is not in vain. We spoke to Fatima Mir, who herself suffered imprisonment and many years of banning. We wanted to understand what had driven this young boy to plant that bomb. Andrew Zondo came from a very conservative Christian family, totally apolitical. And when he was 14, the police charged in while the school was at assembly. They were not even boycotting classes. This is in Kwamashu now. And they were praying, and the police came in, tear-gassed, and then shambocked these children. And that was the moment when this boy began to think that being safe in a middle-class, black, Christian home wasn't the reality at all. And he began to look onto the streets, and he became part and parcel now. You know, now the youth call themselves comrade. Mm. Comrade in township means youth and he had a scholarship lined up for him to go to university. She chose instead to go overseas because he was convinced that the only way in which uh, the, the changes could be brought about in the lives of black people would be through military action. He had lost all hope mm. in negotiation and talking and that kind of business. Two events really were crucial in his life, apart from the tear gassing 
One was the raid on Maputo. He was there when it happened. And he saw how children had been killed by the South African Defence Force. And the other one was the raid into Maseru during Christmas. And, you know, that unhinged him. Now, I went to see him in prison. And the remarkable thing about this young man was his sense of remorse. He kept saying to me, how can I make them understand that I did not do this as a racist thing and I never intended to kill anybody? Now, it seems a kind of a contradiction to say, you lay a bomb, a limpet mine, it explodes, it kills five people, and then for you to say, I never intended to do it. But Joyce, I believed him. The other thing I found very remarkable about this boy is that he continued to, to, to speak about the Freedom Charter. For him, this was the new gospel. He said so in court too, that he had let the ANC down by killing people because he said the ANC didn't do things the way that the SADF did it. But that's the tragedy, that's our youth today. Now they held the trial in a white holiday resort. The judge, who is also the chancellor of our university, then proceeded to sentence him very theatrically. On the first count, I sentence you to death. On the second count, I sentence you to death. And this thing went on five times. He, he stood there by himself and he said, Amangela, in the strongest possible terms. He had been sentenced to death five, five times. times in a matter of five seconds. There was nothing else. So he turned round and he started stepping down into his cell. In his absence, the judge now says, and I sentence you to 10 years for those who would have died but didn't die as a result of that bomb blast. A few weeks before he was hanged, Andrew Zonder drew these sketches for his mother. Mama, Mama, my only request is that you should not worry yourself about me. Find your strength in prayer. Justice will prevail. I am your son, Andrew. Even in the face of execution, Andrew Zondo kept his faith. Prayer also sustains me, but I now believe, like Andrew Zondo, that prayer alone will not free us. Mama, dear leader, Mama, I'm crying. 
Africa sing the song, the song that will break the chains of slavery. <laughs> This group of comrades asked us to film them in front of the altar to bear witness to the justness of their cause. A few months after this meeting, the children barricaded the streets to prevent the heartless rent evictions. The army went from house to house shambocking any young people they found at home. As the children fled to escape the weeping, they were shot dead by the troops outside. Two of these young people died that night. Yesterday it was Hector Peterson. Today are many people. Tomorrow is you and I. Africa do something for this people have fallen. But sir, where are the children girls to night vision but never came back? But sir, where are the children girls to funeral but never came back? I'm asking Potza, where are the children goes to the meetings but never came back? What I'm saying to you, without Divana Nescopio Nemzans Africa, Mama Gutenina, when children have to risk their life for freedom, nevertheless, they lead the nation to salvation, Mama Gutenina. <laughs> I will march till I can see all those who are exiled being freed, even our father and Nelson Mandela walking in the streets of Soweto. That is the day when I say I'm free, then I can be afraid to die. Had I not lived in Joyce's house in Soweto the past few months, these young people would have been unknown to me. Yesterday, when we went to Diplu and just crossing the area that is called Beirut, the young people who were sitting there shouted at me and said, Mama, Mama, Ungaboleta Loba and Dulapa, Asaba Funilana. And all he said was that you must don't, don't bring these people to Soweto, we don't want them here anymore. I know it's probably time is running out. But perhaps when I next return to South Africa, I can't share my face, never mind in your garden, but in Soweto, because of the anger of the children. And you never thought, in, my, in fact, in my life, I never thought I would ever look for protection from young people. But you know, also sitting in your garden the other day, Joyce, watching the kids go to a funeral, lorry after lorry and taxi after taxi with the children, singing and shouting. I was struck at the strength of the children because I, what I couldn't help feeling was some of them were going to their death that day or could have been going to their death. It 
just a, long, a normal funeral. But when we came back from the funeral, they started shooting tear gas. When we came to the mourner's house, we busy the queuing because it's traditional for us. If we come from a funeral, we should go and eat. They came to that house and they shot tear gas into the pot of the food because they didn't want us to eat. So we were furious, but we didn't fight against them because we understand if it's a funeral, it has to be a day of peace for us. They started throwing tear gas again. And uh, an old man, an old man of about 65 years or 72 years there, was shot dead because he was standing at the corner. Now he's working, he's just a weary person who's working slowly. He was shot dead because he couldn't run the way we, 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 we could run. He was shot dead. And two infants were choked, they were exhausted in, in a shack. Chagas, four Chagas canisters were shot into a shack and they died. Mama, I can't describe my feelings the way I was angry. I felt the Boers kill us in order to rule us. I felt they should respect the funeral. We don't go to funerals to fight them. We go because we want to give our last respects to the people they have killed. The way they treat us is unspeakable. They shoot at our funerals, and each time we go to bury our dead, we come back with corpses. So we fought against them, you see. And they asked five people to come and negotiate with them. Okay, myself and other people who are in the leadership. We just left our group behind and went to them. There was an open space. They had their blockade there. And they came close to 15 or 12 policemen. They came, but when we were just in the middle, you can see just five meters away from them, they started shooting us with uh, rubber bullets. I was hit with, uh, with another comrade of mine. Two people were hit. So the people, when they saw this, they got angry. And then they started again throwing petrol bombs at them. Now they started shooting now with uh, live ammunition. And they shot three people. Three people died at the same spot. And those were, their age were uh, ranging from 18, 15, and eight years old. There are now sanctuaries throughout this country which give shelter to our hunted youth. What did your mother think when you had to leave home? They feel sad, but they feel there's nothing they can do because they can see what's happening outside. And because they are old and they're not able to fight, they have handed over to us. How do you feel having to leave your baby? Mama, I feel very sad. My parents know how much we are oppressed. I have hoped that they are going to bring up my child in the way that they brought me up. But because they fear for our safety and they feel that rather than we be killed by the Boers, we should flee for some time. So this is what we decided with them. I definitely am not afraid to die because many children have been killed in South Africa and many are in detention because of fighting for the struggle. So why should we question which child should die and which child should be arrested when all of us are fighting for the same cause? And what about you? I also, Mama, am not afraid to die because I won't have died in disgrace if I died in the struggle. I will be fighting for my nation. In the back of the location, just behind the location, there is a river that it runs there. They started interrogating me, putting chokes on me, hitting me with hammers, and I, I, I was unconscious, I fainted. And find that I woke up at the police station again. Took me to my cell. They came there with a, a bicep, and then they, they just want they wanted to pull my nails off. 
I cried in agony until I felt that I had to just to look at that man and let him do what he wants to do to me because I couldn't take it anymore. And he kept on pulling me, kept on pulling my, 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 my nails. I cried till my breath was out. I just looked at him and stared at him. And they left me there. They sent somebody who they said he, he was a doctor, but I would feel and I would sense that he was not a doctor. He was a policeman. Came there and messaged me. I said to him, leave me alone because I know that you are working with these people. Okay, just let my mother come and see me. Or let at least a doctor, a black doctor come and see me or examine me because I don't, I don't want you. Because he was, he was a boy. So I, I, I had nothing to do with the boys. It's not to say that we hate them or we don't want them. We hate what they are doing to us. Kill the boy, kill the hippos, kill, kill, kill the boy, kill the parliament, kill, kill, kill the boy, kill the authorities, kill, kill the boy, kill the customers, kill, kill. Kill the ex complete, in jail. Relax, complex, house, in jail. House, relax, complex, house, in jail. House, who put a lot of food, take your baby, put a foot, it's not your lot of food. Okay, they released me and they warned me. They said, if there was going to be any funeral, if they hear that I am there, they are definitely going to kill me and keep it as a secret. One night, Benji left the sanctuary to visit his mother. He was arrested. His jacket was returned with seven bullet holes. When Benji's death came, I, yes, she was real lousy. You don't know what to do. See. I was very sad when I heard the news of my boy's death. Uh, first time when we get inside the mortuary, we get in a white sergeant there. Well, he was talking all right with us. Yes, he didn't shout us. So he asked me what do, what do I want. I told him no. I come here looking for my brother. He asked me who's your brother. I said Benjamin Oliphant. He said how oh, they want who they kill them. I said yes. So first of all, we fill the forms. After filling the forms, and then they take us inside the mortuary. So we find Benji there, and he was well beaten. His head was swollen up. And he lost his one eye on the right side, was not there. So his jaws was also broken. So his face was full of blood. Yes.
because we, we, we don't shed tears. If people die, we don't shed tears. And we say that we must keep on uh, uh, waging the struggle because we feel and we know that many people are going to die even if we wage the struggle. I, <laughs> I feel helpless because he was the, <laughs> the best one who I love him. Benji was just like a flower. If they can come anytime or see me anywhere and shoot me, I don't mind to mean that I died for the nation. I didn't die for the oppressors or the white people who are oppressing us. Mama.